Father, again, we stand in your presence by means of the Lord Jesus Christ and in the Holy Spirit. Thankful for such an access, thankful for the wonders of your grace, for the greatness of your love, for the realization that our God is God. May the Holy Spirit take charge of this time and just minister to each of our hearts. Minister that message which we need. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com. We're going to depart from our normal verse-by-verse -verse study to celebrate Christmas. Man in his extreme conceit uh, concludes that, well, morality just, well, basically grew out of nothing. You know, that meaning came from no meaning. That purpose came from no purpose. And, and that by almost, uh, by some almost infinite probability, life sprang into existence. And then slowly over the years, it reached the grand pinnacle of success that we see today without one shred of evidence. The majority of the human race has concluded that there is no God. But we who know and love the Lord have the counsel of His Word that God shaped from the dust of the earth the first man. We are not the grand peak of man's uh, experiment or man's success and, and striving over the millennia. We are, in fact, at the foot of the mountain, the garbage and the refuge of the, of the world's system. And the wages of sin we know are death. Now, I don't know that we're able to, in, in any possible way, to really know what it must have been like for Adam. Uh, we do know Adam was a brilliant man. He was, a, he was an innocent man. He was able to, to name all of the animals of the earth. He was able to, to walk and to commune with God. The eternal, loving, heavenly Father had made for Adam a helpmate that was absolutely suited for for him, just for Adam. I don't know that there are any perfect marriages, but you know, Adam's had to be as close to perfect as just about as any marriage could possibly get. I'd imagine that they, uh, they had, they had a tremendous life together. I mean, what an opportunity to teach your children! What an opportunity to proclaim everything that God had done to raise your children up in the Lord, to raise them up in the faith. But with innocence comes responsibility, and so there was a, there was a responsibility. And we find that Adam did not live up to that responsibility. Adam uh, lived to be a good many years and lots of time, and he had lots of time, he had lots of children, and you know, how could he have instructed them and taught them? You know, uh, he should have, you know, the first child was a, a boy and, and most fathers seem to want their first child to be a boy. And, and that boy killed his brother. And we see the results of that disobedience, that uh, shrinking of responsibility until most of the human race is destroyed in the flood. But the same God that, that plucked Adam from the dust of the earth plucked Noah from that garbage, that refuse. Bear in mind, the scriptures tell us that every man's thought was only evil continually, and that included Noah, okay? But God plucked Noah out of that mess, and Noah labored faithfully for really more years than, than you and I will ever live. What an opportunity to talk to his children. What an opportunity to explain to them that, that even though there wasn't any water around this, this ship that he was building, this ark would preserve human life on the earth because God is judging sin. 
and what an experience that it must have been for all of those years while the you know the neighbors watched and, and they laughed and they joked about it i'm sure that they did as they went about their daily business their ba daily activities and and there's old nutty noah okay he's working on his boat but you know but noah was faithful he was faithful to the lord and the rains came and he and his family and those animals were saved they were preserved through through the greatest disaster that the earth had ever known. What an experience that that must have been. What an opportunity to sit down after the ark had, had finally landed safely and, then, and they found themselves not only safe and alive, but with the opportunity to re-inhabit the earth and yet with a snap of the fingers, Noah's drunk and his children are engaged in, in things which, well, they, they shouldn't have been. And though, the, no, though Noah was an old man and he had opportunity to instruct his children and, and, and he, was a, he was an industrious man, you know, who labored... <clears throat> he labored diligently to build the ark. You know, which, and what an engineering feat that must have been with the tools that he had. Yet his heritage ended at the Tower of Babel, and out of that confusion, God plucked Abraham. And so Abraham, he also lived for, well, he lived a long and productive life. Abraham was a wealthy man. In fact, when five kings in, engaged uh, him in battle and, and took his nephew in bondage, he was able to defeat those kings and restore his nephew, you know, as well as his, his family, uh, to their uh, rightful place, their rightful possessions. He was, he was not only a wealthy and a powerful man, and he, and he and lived a good many years. He had tremendous opportunity to instruct his children. But his children wound up in bondage. And then there was Moses. You know, Moses plucked by God from the river. I mean, think of that. Adam, you know, plucked from the dust of the earth. Noah plucked from the filth of humanity. Abraham plucked from the confusion of the Tower of Babel. And now Moses plucked from the river. A baby. Moses also lived a, a good many years. He was a highly educated man. Very educated, in fact. The scriptures declare that he was trained in all of the wisdom of Egypt. And with all of that, all of that education, with all of that experience, you know, and the tremendous evidence that, that God had given him, you know, as he led the, the children of Israel out of Egypt, out of the devastated land of Egypt, and led them on dry land through the Red Sea, you know, he, you know, he preserved them uh, in the wilderness. He preserved them with manna, in the wilderness and, he, and water from the rock every day. Evidences of God's grace and God's power, obvious ev evidences of that. And, you know, the great privilege of instructing the people and the things of the Lord. And yet, well, he didn't take God at his word. And because he did not believe God, he left these people in the wilderness. And he didn't, he didn't enter into that promised land of rest. Doesn't mean he didn't go to heaven. He just didn't find rest. Now I've gone through four unique individuals. There's never been anything like these individuals. We, we could spend a lot more time in the scriptures, I'm sure, uh, looking at other individuals as well. But just let me suggest two others, okay? There was Samson. Strongest man that ever lived. I mean, what an opportunity to use his strength to proclaim the grace of God 
and to, and to instruct the family that God may have given him. But he didn't choose to go God's way. You know, he, he wanted women who were not women suited for him. And not only did he die in disgrace, but he left his people without a leader. And then there was Solomon. Okay, the wisest man that ever lived. No one, no one before and no one ever after ever equaled the wisdom of Solomon. You know, here's a man, okay, who could instruct his family in the ways of God. He, he was wise enough to pin the wisdom of Solomon. In fact, he so impressed the queen of Sheba that she went back utterly amazed, and yet in all of that wisdom, he submitted himself to his lust, and he divided the kingdom of the people of God, which began its initial destruction. And now we come to today, and we see a baby in a manger, not a man plucked from the dust of the earth or from the dregs of society or from the confusion of, of Babel, but a little baby in a manger and the world becomes immersed in the romance of the story. You know, it doesn't matter really whether they believe it or not. It's just wonderful to give presents, you know, it's to have goodwill you know, we have people killing themselves to feed the hungry one day out of year. Well, let me tell you, those people get hungry in February as well. And the romance of, of, of the story, you know, that so intrigues the minds of people around the world has confused and hidden the importance of this day. We had a man Okay, we had a man that is, was, was absolutely innocent. We had a brilliant man, brilliant mind, who was industrious and energetic, a man who was wealthy and powerful, a man who was educated in all the wisdom of Egypt, a man who's the, who was the wisest man who ever lived, and a man who's the strongest man that ever lived. But, we have no atonement. We have no expiation. We, we have no satisfaction. We have no mediator. We have no redeemer. Each of these individuals lived many, many years, but that babe in the manger did not. Let me quote one of our leading uh, theologians today. One of our leading theologians of this generation was asked whether or not Christ was married to Mary Magdalene. You know, if you've read the Da Vinci Code, you've read trash. L let me read the answer here. The biological deaths or the biological details, okay, of his life are of no real importance. He was a man who worked hard, he was badly hurt, he died at a young age. You know, wouldn't it be comforting to know that just maybe, just maybe, there was a home somewhere for this guy and a fireplace someplace where he could, you know, find warmth and happiness and, you know, and that's Christianity. Dearly beloved, the central theme of Christmas is not the shepherds in the field or the angels singing. Uh, personally, I don't believe that they do. I don't believe that they sing. I, I believe that they proclaim, that they speak, saying unto you this day, there is born a Savior who is Christ the Lord 
it isn't wise men coming from the east, you know, following a star to seek the king and the savior, bringing him gifts. It isn't the giving of the gifts. It isn't the sentimentality of the manger. It's that Jesus Christ was born of a virgin. Then you say, well, Steve, you know what I mean? Well, everybody knows that. You know, we, we sing of virgin birth. We have the nativity scene. There's, there's the virgin, and most, most don't believe that he was virgin born. But folks, if, if Jesus Christ was not virgin born, then he's not God. He's just another one of these individuals whose lives end in defeat. Now, I'm not, I'm not critical of Adam or Noah or Abraham or Moses or Samson or Solomon or you or myself for that matter. For we all know that the wages of sin is death, but we've passed out of death into life because of that virgin birth, because God became man, lived, died, was buried, and raised again from the dead. And that, and that man, because of the fall, is totally depraved. What, what these people show us is not the defeat of man, the important lesson that we learn is not that man is really totally depraved, even though it's true that we need to understand that, but that we absolutely need atonement. We need atonement. We need satisfaction. We need to be reconciled to God. We need to know that we have a mediator between God and man, and that that is the person of our Lord Jesus Christ who is also man, man and God, not half and half, fully God, fully man. He's also God, he's man, but he's also God. If Christ is of natural generation, then Christ is no different than any other man. I mean, people love, they love the Christmas story today, and yet so many lose sight of the fact that our Redeemer is God, a very God who by his design became our kinsman, and to be our kinsman, he had to be virgin born. Our enemy, of course, doesn't like that. And so much of Christianity today is, is concentrated on the virgin and, and Mary, you know, uh, virtually replaces the babe in a manger. He, he's only a baby in Mary's arms, folks, because that's the process by which he became our kinsman. And he became our kinsman because God declared that we need a kinsman redeemer. We can't redeem ourselves. We need someone who is able to pay the debt. God has shown us great men of the past that He chose. But in all of that, in all of that, they could not redeem you. Dearly beloved, we don't need a gushy story at Christmas. We need to recognize that the God who ordained us, the God who chose us, is the God who redeemed us. And that what we are seeing is a supernatural process. I'm not suggesting to you that in order for a person to go to heaven that they must believe that Jesus Christ is virgin born. What I am telling you directly, straight from the shoulder, is that if Jesus was not born of a virgin conceived of by the Holy Spirit, and, you know, Mary, keep in mind, Mary was a sinner as you and I were a sinner. And she called Christ Savior as you and I call Him Savior. The important thing is that He was conceived of the Holy Spirit and it was God Almighty, God of very God, yet it, it it, yet man of very man, our kinsman, the one who, who could only, only he could pay the price necessary to redeem us. The story of Christmas, dearly beloved, is redemption. Dearly beloved, it is the story of redemption in every day in the life of the believer. 
should be Christmas. <laughs> Take my hand 